If you're watching along with this at home, thinking to yourself, ooh, I need a graph database, guess what? You are in luck, my friend. Next up, on the to the CityJS 2021 stage for your entertainment, education, and general viewing delight is William, all the way from Montana in the United States of America. William is a software engineer with Neo4j, and in this talk, William is going to be looking at GraphQL databases, Neo4j, and pretty much everything in between. He argues they are a match made in heaven. I guess we'll be the judge of that. Am I right, folks? If during this talk any questions pop into your mind, please do make a note of them and join us for the Q&A session, which will be starting immediately after this talk. If you're watching along on YouTube, don't forget to post along in the comments. And of course, keep your social media posts coming in on the proviso that you use the hashtag CityJS2021. Without further ado, William, it is my pleasure to hand the stage over to you. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining today. In this talk, I'd like to talk about two technologies that each on their own, I, I think is really interesting and really powerful, but when they're combined together, become sort of a supercharger for developers to build really powerful applications. Uh, and those technologies are GraphQL and Neo4j. So my name is Will. Uh, I work for a company called Neo4j, which is a graph database. Uh, we'll talk a bit about Neo4j in a minute here. Uh, I work on the developer relations team, uh, but in the role of a developer. So I work on not the core database, but instead on extensions and tooling around the database to make it easier to use Neo4j with different frameworks. Uh, I write a blog and a newsletter that are linked there, uh, as well as my Twitter handle, which if you want to get a hold of me is, is probably uh, the best place. I've also been writing a book called Full Stack GraphQL that's available from Manning now in an early release. Uh, we have the first seven chapters uh, that are available. Uh, if you'd like to read uh, an excerpt, the, the first three chapters are available for free at that link, grandstack.io slash ebook. Uh, the book focuses on showing how to build full stack GraphQL applications using uh, what we call GrandStack, which is GraphQL, React, Apollo, and Neo4j database. Um, and some of the concepts in the book we'll, we'll talk about today, but really I think the, the book captures a lot of what I've learned working with users uh, that are building applications using uh, GraphQL and Neo4j. So let's talk about the, the two main characters in our story, which are Neo4j and GraphQL. So Neo4j is primarily a graph database, a database management system. Uh, so similar to other databases uh, where the data model is a, a document or tables with Neo4j, the data model is a graph. So when we say graph, we mean nodes. These are the entities and relationships connect them. Uh, this data model in Neo4j is called the property graph model because we can store arbitrary key value pair properties on nodes and relationships. We use a query language called Cypher to interact with data in Neo4j. We'll see some examples of, of Cypher in a little bit here, but you can think of Cypher as kind of like SQL, but for graphs. Now, because we work with data as graphs in Neo4j, there are lots of interesting things that you can do with the data beyond sort of the uh, transactional type of workloads where we're building applications. Uh, there are lots of interesting use cases in graph analytics, graph visualization, where we're maybe applying some graph algorithms to the data using visualization tooling to explore and interpret the results. Now, when we're talking about GraphQL, GraphQL is an API query language uh, and runtime for building APIs. 
GraphQL has a strict type system that defines the types, uh, the fields on each type, how the data is connected. And this is where the graph part in GraphQL comes in, that that type system includes references to other types, which are the connections, the relationships in the data model. It's important to point out that GraphQL is data layer agnostic. Uh, so we can build GraphQL APIs uh, that use databases, uh, that call out to other APIs, um, et cetera. So GraphQL is very flexible uh, in that regard. I guess if, if there's sort of two takeaways that I wanted want to get from each of these technologies independently, I guess for Neo4j, the takeaway would be that Neo4j is optimized for graph traversal, uh, for working with graphs at every stage. So the, the way that we model, the way that we work with data using Cypher, uh, and then the performance optimizations, all of that is optimized for a graph. Uh, and I guess if the one takeaway that I would want for GraphQL is really that GraphQL is not a database query language, uh, but very much an API query language focused on relationships in the data. Now, when we put these two technologies together, um, you can sort of see, well, okay, we're talking about graphs and with both of these, so it probably makes sense to use something like a, a graph database as a backend for a GraphQL API. We, we sort of remove this mapping and translation layer. So we have uh, the application data modeled to the client as a graph. Then we're working with that data as a graph and the backend as a graph database. That seems like a really good fit. One thing that I think is, is maybe less obvious is the benefit that we get of type safety when working with building GraphQL APIs on top of Neo4j. So Neo4j is a schemaless, or we call it a schema optional database where we can define some database constraints, but largely we don't define a database schema at the database layer. Uh, now, when we're working with GraphQL, the type system of GraphQL can then act as a sort of schema for the database. So I think there's really this mutually beneficial or, or symbiotic relationship when we start working with Neo4j and GraphQL together, where they both benefit from the uh, type safety uh, and the type system of GraphQL. Uh, and then they also both benefit from the performance optimizations for traversing a data graph that graph databases like Neo4j are, are built for. To make using these technologies easier to work with, there is a Neo4j GraphQL API library uh, available for building Node.js GraphQL APIs, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, and really the, the benefit of this library is we can use the GraphQL type definitions to define the data model in the database. So we have this sort of one unified uh, schema for the database and the API. Uh, and as a result of that, we can then generate resolvers, we can generate database fetching code from arbitrary GraphQL requests, which can be really powerful by reducing the amount of sort of boilerplate logic that we have to write uh, as developers when building a GraphQL API. So let, let's talk about these a, a bit more independently. Um, so Neo4j, we said, is a graph database. We use this, this query language called Cypher. Here's an example of a Cypher query on the screen there. And you can see we're drawing this sort of ASCII art notation to define these graph patterns. Um, let's take a look in a bit more detail uh, at how Cypher works and some of the Neo4j tooling. Uh, so this is Neo4j browser. This is kind of like a query workbench for uh, working with Neo4j. So I, I have uh, Neo4j instance running locally on my machine. Uh, we can switch over to Neo4j desktop. Here we go. So I have Neo4j desktop uh, running locally with my database of business reviews. So you can see we have uh, data about users who write reviews. 
those reviews are connected to businesses and businesses are assigned to categories. Let's take a look at a Cypher query example. Here we are searching for a user node with the name Will. Uh, so here's our graph pattern in this Cypher statement. We have parentheses that are sort of drawing this node uh, with the label user where the name property is Will and then we're returning that. So here's the Will node. If we double click on this, we can traverse out and we can see, okay, well here are the reviews that this user has written. Here's the, the business connected to the review. We can traverse out uh, to find other people who have written reviews of the same business uh, and so on. So we can traverse out through the graph that way, sort of visually, uh, but we can also define more complex patterns in our cipher statement. So here, We've added a bit more complex pattern. and We're saying, okay, not only find this user will, but now traverse out. So you can see how we draw this sort of uh, arrow relationship representation uh, to find uh, reviews of businesses. So if we run this, here are all the uh, reviews and the businesses connected to those reviews that Will has written. Um, okay, so what about for more complex business logic uh, where maybe we want to generate some personalized results? So based on the businesses that this user has reviewed, can we recommend some businesses that they might be interested in? Well, to do that, we're going to say, okay, let's find all the businesses that this user has reviewed. Now, what category are those businesses in? And then let's find other businesses in those same categories that this user has not written a review of. Those might be good uh, results. This is sort of um, traversing the graph to find uh, businesses this user might be interested in based on their previous preferences uh, expressed in Cypher. Okay, so that was a quick look at some of the developer tooling uh, for Neo4j. How do we build applications that use Neo4j and Cypher? Well, to do that, we take advantage of the language drivers for Neo4j. Uh, here's an example where we're using the JavaScript language driver for Neo4j. We're executing that recommendation Cypher query we saw just a minute ago where we're generating personalized recommendations for this user, returning the results, uh, and then we get back a result set and work with that in JavaScript. Now, when we're building applications, we don't wanna just sort of expose the Cypher endpoint essentially to the clients of our application. Instead, we wanna build the API layer. And in the API layer, we want to uh, define some of the business logic, build the authorization layer, these sorts of things. And that's where GraphQL comes in. Let's take a look now at a GraphQL example. Uh, so this movies.grandstack.io, uh, this is just a, a demo GraphQL endpoint that uses uh, data on movies and user reviews of movies. We can see the GraphQL Playground tooling. This is uh, sort of like the equivalent of, of Neo4j browser, but, but for uh, GraphQL, kind of like a query workbench, uh, similar, similar idea for tooling. One benefit about uh, GraphQL, because we have the type system, we can do what's called introspection, where we ask the API for the data uh, definition that it has. So what are, the, what are the types? What are the entry points? What are the fields? How is that data connected? And we can then generate tooling like documentation uh, based on that. So one thing that's nice with GraphQL is we can sort of see generated documentation for the API. So here 
we can search for all of the users, uh, what movies have they reviewed, and we get back data that exactly matches our request. So we can add fields here, like say, okay, we also want to traverse out to the actors for each of these movies and show the results. Uh, and for each of these users, we may also want to show uh, recommended movies. So based on your, this user's reviews, what are some business, some uh, movies that they might be interested in? Uh, and this logic, uh, how that recommendation is generated, that lives uh, somewhere in the API layer in the GraphQL application. Uh, the client doesn't have to think about that, but still has access uh, to that feature. Okay, so that was an example uh, of using GraphQL. Um, you know, it, again, it's important to point out that GraphQL is an API query language, not a database query language, uh, which means that it maybe doesn't have some of the uh, expressivity you might expect in a database query language, things like projections, aggregations, uh, these sorts of things. Um, and again, while GraphQL exposes our data as a graph, it's not just for graph databases. We can build GraphQL APIs uh, using really any data layer uh, from databases to other APIs. So some of the benefits of GraphQL, well, GraphQL addresses uh, this problem that's called overfetching, where with, say, a REST API, maybe we're sending back uh, more data than what actually needs to be rendered in the view of an application. Whereas in GraphQL, the client can select specifically the fields that are needed to render the view. Uh, with GraphQL, the client can also specify uh, other fields that are needed to render the view as well. Uh, this is sort of traversing the data graph to bring back all the data needed rather than making uh, multiple requests to render the, the data for the view. Um, there's also this idea that I think is really important of simplifying data fetching by having more component-based data interactions where we're sort of encapsulating the logic uh, of data fetching in a component, which we'll take a look at um, in a minute. Of course, GraphQL is not a silver bullet. There are some challenges that commonly come up when building GraphQL APIs. Um, this is largely around things that are, have well understood best practices from the REST world that don't necessarily apply in the GraphQL world. Um, of course, there are tooling and best practices that address some of these issues. These are just some of the common things that come up when you're first adopting GraphQL. Um, one thing that commonly comes up is this n plus one query problem, uh, where we end up making multiple round trips to the data layer from our GraphQL API because of the nested structure of a lot of GraphQL queries. Um, so we'll talk about this one in a bit more detail um, in a minute. So how do we build GraphQL services. Here's sort of the, the common three-step approach. Um, the first step is to build your GraphQL type definition. So to define the data in the API, this is typically done using the GraphQL schema definition language, or SDL. SDL is kind of a language agnostic way of defining the type definitions. This can also be done uh, programmatically, but SDL uh, is a, a common approach here. Now the next step then is to build the GraphQL resolvers. Resolvers are the functions that actually have the logic for fetching data from the data layer. Here's a couple of examples of what resolvers might look like. On the left, we're querying out to a database. We're then sort of filtering and massaging the results uh, before returning that from the resolver function. And on the right, we're using uh, an ORM to make requests to a database. Um, in this case, on the right, this is for an API that was built for a conference website. So we're searching for sessions by keyword. Then for each session, we're going back to the database to find uh, the room it was in, to find the theme it was in, or to find 
uh, recommendations. So you can see with the sort of nested structure how we can uh, easily end up making multiple round trip requests to the data layer inside GraphQL resolvers. Once we have our type definitions and resolvers, we then combine those and create an executable GraphQL schema, which can then be served over a uh, networking layer. Apollo server makes this, uh, makes this a smooth process uh, to combine type definitions, resolvers, and then handles uh, network requests and executing the schema. So there are some common challenges or, or problems that come up with that approach. Uh, things like schema duplication, where we're maintaining a schema for the API, one for the database, this sort of mapping and translation layer where we're going from uh, graph representation on the front end to then uh, translating that to, if we're not using a graph database on the back end, uh, how we were modeling and thinking of that data. There's a lot of boilerplate code often in resolvers uh, where we're uh, making requests to the data layer. And then, of course, this n plus 1 query problem and performance issues associated with that, where we want to avoid making multiple round trips to the data layer. Let's take a look at this in a context of a full stack application. Uh, so this is a podcast application that I've been building on, uh, on a live stream called Grandcast FM, again, using GraphQL, React, Apollo, and EFJ database. So there, there are essentially three views for this application. So searching for podcasts, uh, viewing the episode feed, where maybe we have some personalized logic for showing episodes of podcasts that a user subscribes to, and then a detailed episode component where we want to show the show notes, uh, play the podcast, add it to a playlist, uh, and so on. Each of those views has a GraphQL query that can render all of the data necessary for that view. So this is the idea of being able to encapsulate uh, the data fetching logic with the component, um, which is quite nice from a developer's perspective. That data comes back to us from the GraphQL API as JSON, uh, which is then makes sense for passing those as props to our React components to then take care of rendering that data. In the back end, um, this is how that data is resolved. For search, we're actually calling out to a REST API uh, that is the podcast index service. So this is a great example of GraphQL being data layer agnostic, where we can combine data layers uh, and serve one sort of unified GraphQL API. Uh, so for searching, we call out to the podcast index REST API. For the feed, we have uh, a query that goes to Neo4j with some personalization logic for how to find the most relevant episodes for that user. Um, in this case, that example query, we're just looking for the most recent episodes of all the podcasts that this user subscribes to. Then for the episode view, we're looking up an episode by ID and then traversing to the podcast that it is uh, connected to. Here's how the architecture uh, for an application like that might look from the user's perspective, where in this case we're using uh, Netlify and all of the static assets are served from the Netlify CDN. Uh, once that React application is loaded in the user's browser, it becomes then a client for our GraphQL API and makes requests to the GraphQL API, which in this case is hosted as an AWS Lambda as a serverless function. So the function is the API, which is a, a common way to deploy GraphQL APIs. Uh, and that data then is being resolved from a Neo4j Aura database cluster. Now, of course, users don't really care how their uh, the application is architected and deployed. They just want to know that it is fast and that it looks nice and that it works. But of course, as developers, this is something that, that we care about quite a bit. This is sort of from a developer perspective, the serviceful uh, or, or serverless. I, I like to think of 
uh, service full as embracing services rather than serverless, but I think you can use those terms interchangeably. Or in this case, for, to deploy our application, uh, we just push some code to GitHub. The Netlify platform then triggers a build uh, and pushes assets to the CDN and deploys our API as a Lambda function uh, to AWS. And then for the database layer, we have access to Neo4j developer tooling like Neo4j browser uh, and command line tooling as well for working with our Aura database cluster. So let's go back to, to this slide where we were talking about some of the common problems with that sort of three-step process of building GraphQL APIs where we define our type definitions, we uh, define our resolvers, and then we combine those and serve an executable schema. Uh, so these are some of the problems that we mentioned before, uh, the n plus one query problem, writing a lot of boilerplates. And there's tooling that's emerged that I think ha does a great job of addressing some of these common problems that come up when building GraphQL APIs, uh, which are GraphQL database integrations. I, I think of them as sort of engines for building GraphQL APIs. So we talked about the Neo4j GraphQL library uh, as being a tool to help us build these APIs. At a high level, the goals are to reduce boilerplate, improve developer productivity, uh, and to be extensible and optimized for performance. In a detailed perspective, uh, what this library does is it takes GraphQL type definitions to then define what the data model in the database should be. It then auto generates a CRUD GraphQL API. So a GraphQL API with all the operations for creating, updating, uh, deleting, and reading data. And for any arbitrary GraphQL request that comes in, translates that to Cypher and sends that to the database which means that the developer does not need to build now these resolver functions. For custom logic, we can then define Cypher queries that are then attached to the GraphQL schema. Uh, here's an example. Let's take a look at this on Code Sandbox. So Code Sandbox, if you're not familiar, allows us to run uh, JavaScript code on someone else's containers in the browser, uh, which is quite nice. Uh, so here we have this GraphQL schema. Um, so this is the data set that we saw earlier of businesses, users, reviews, and categories. Um, but now we've added a Cypher query here on the recommended field on the business type where we've defined a Cypher query for traversing the graph to find personalized results uh, based on users that have reviewed this business. So for users that are reviewed this business, what are other businesses that, they, that, sim that same user is reviewing? That might be a good uh, recommendation. If we take a look at the code here, uh, we're pulling in the Neo4j GraphQL integration uh, and then we're just passing our type definitions to the Neo4j GraphQL integration. We're not building uh, any resolver functions that say how to generate data fetching uh, code. That's all handled by the Neo4j GraphQL integration. Uh, here's our GraphQL API. If we run a query, you can see this one is uh, a bit more complex. We're searching for businesses within 100 meters of a certain point and then finding users that have reviewed the business and finding recommendations. Uh, and then we can see the Cypher query here in the debug output that is generated based on this GraphQL query. Uh, so the, the code for this example is on GitHub, uh, but I think it's a good example of showing the power of using the Neo4j GraphQL integration to build uh, APIs. Uh, if you're curious how GraphQL database tools like this are able to generate uh, data fetching queries, they use what's called the resolve info object that's passed to every resolver. 
Uh, the resolve info object contains a lot of information about the GraphQL API and the query uh, that is being executed. Um, I gave a talk at, at GraphQL Summit uh, a year ago that dives into a lot more detail. So if you're interested in that, uh, check that out. This then, this concept of these database GraphQL integrations opens up this whole new world of building low-code tools. I like to think of this as a spectrum from libraries like this to command line uh, tools to then UI-driven tools that can help us build, in this case, GraphQL APIs. Um, some of the command line tools we have are the Create Grand Stack app for building out uh, a full Grand Stack application. And the low code tools like GraphQL Architect, this is a plugin for NeoFJ Desktop that when we first uh, connect to a NeoFJ database, will automatically generate the GraphQL type definitions based on the database uh, and then allow us to develop and test our GraphQL API before deploying it. So that's all I have uh, to share today. I'll leave with a few resources. One is grandstack.io, uh, which has the documentation and examples for a lot of the tooling we talked about today. Um, again, I mentioned the full stack GraphQL book that I've been working on. There's a free three chapter excerpt at that link, grandstack.io slash ebook. Um, and finally, I've been trying out doing some live streaming uh, in the last few months. So we've built a few applications using NeoFJ and GraphQL on the NeoFJ live stream, uh, which would be a great place if you'd like to join and come say hi. Uh, hopefully we'll see you there. So thanks so much uh, for watching this talk and hope you're enjoying the rest of the conference. Cheers. William, that was a fantastic talk. Thank you very much for delivering it as part of this year's conference. I am quite confident in saying that you just have gained an entire audience full of your graph database. Fantastic stuff. To everyone watching along at home, you know what time it is. It's time for that round the world round of applause. Our Q&A session with William will be starting over on Gather Town any moment now, so please do head on over if you have access. If not, let us know what you thought of the talk over on Twitter using the hashtag TJS2021, as well as keep posting along in the comments on YouTube. It's been really, really good to see uh, how engaged you've been with everything today. Fantastic stuff. Um, we're heading into a break now, so we'll see you shortly for your next session with Dennis. Alakazam. William, thank you very much for such an amazing talk as part of this year's CityJS conference. I'm sure people took a lot away from it about GraphQL and Neo4j. And excitingly, we've already had some questions come in. So how do you feel about diving into the question straight away? Great, let's do it. Um, so the first one is all about trade-offs. So you've been talking about low code and GraphQL. Um, what are some of the trade-offs that need to be made in order to implement GraphQL in a no or low code uh, base? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. Um, I, I, I think this idea of, of low code in general, and, and in, in the talk, I, I talked about this idea of the, the low code spectrum. Um, I, I don't think there's just kind of like one clear thing that defines what is low code. Um, but I, I think the the big advantage that you get with low code toolings and, and some of the, the GraphQL tooling that I uh, went through in the talk uh, gets at this as well is this getting started experience, right? So I, I wanna build a full stack application. I don't wanna spend a whole lot of time writing boilerplate code to, to set up my basic CRUD operation and data fetching. Um, and so with the NeoFJ GraphQL tooling that, that I talked about, uh, you can sort of get up and running with a full CRUD API, don't have to write data fetching logic just defined from your GraphQL schema. And that's that's really, really powerful for getting your application up and running. So the, the trade-off of that then though is, all right, what, am I locked in to sort of like how this schema is generated? How do I add custom logic? Um, and there are ways to, to approach that, right? So I talked about this, this concept of the Cypher schema directive, where you can attach logic in your GraphQL schema using Cypher um, that addresses some of that. And, and then there are some 
uh, like escape hatches beyond the, the sort of generated logic where you can implement resolvers yourself and whatnot. But I think in general, that's kind of the, the main trade-off that you have is I can get up and running really, really quickly with a full generated CRUD GraphQL API, build my full stack application. But then there are some, uh, some opinions built into how that schema is generated. I need to think about then how to add some of my custom logic. And I think this is where that idea of the low code spectrum comes in, right? So if I'm, I'm on the, in the diagram, the right end of that spectrum where we're using like UI only tooling, uh, there, there's not a lot of ways to sort of pop that escape hatch and start adding my like custom, in this case, custom GraphQL resolvers. So I might switch to the other end of that spectrum where I'm using just the, the library and package that's uh, giving me a lot of the query generation uh, bit, but I have a lot more ability to sort of add my own code and logic there. Anyway, that, that's how I, I think of this, this trade-off is really this, this idea of the low code uh, spectrum, really. So thinking about low code, can you envisage a future where none of us are actually writing very much code at all and that we're just building all these things using low or no code uh, implementations? I don't think so. I I think Ooh. I would say it's it's probably looking at the future of low code the way I see it the benefit is making code more accessible to to more sort of career paths and functions, right? So so actually I think more of us will be writing code in in the future enabled by by low code tooling, right? And and I think this example uh, that we talked about where we're using GraphQL to sort of drive the database and to drive our uh, our API schema is a great example because learning GraphQL schema definition language is a lot more accessible than it is for writing like database fetching code using database drivers and, and things like this. So it enables, in my mind, like a broader audience. And, and in this case, it's really like full stack developers that I, I, I think it, it um, makes a lot of sense for, and, and maybe if you're a front end developer and, and you haven't done much database work, this then makes building that back end and, and the database area much more accessible because everything is driven from GraphQL. So I see this idea just really extending on to other domains as well, where maybe you're an analyst who is familiar with some of these like UI driven tools, but there's some low code abstraction that makes it easier for you to actually write some code and maybe that's SQL, maybe that's query languages like Cypher that are more integrated with this tooling. So yeah, anyway, that, that's, I think low code is really a really interesting area that obviously mm -hmm. is really hot right now. And then there's a lot of interesting things developed there. I, I think there's a lot of things yet to emerge from that. So very interested to see what comes out. Yeah, it's definitely an exciting space, 100%. Um, so we had a, a another question come in, um, which I'll jump on to now. Um, and this is from Andre. Um, Andre tried Neo4j on Heroku a few years back, but couldn't establish a connection. Um, do you have any advice on debugging uh, the connections in that kind of instance? And um, that might just be a more verbose output, for example. Um, any any tips for Andre? Um, yeah, so I think it, it sounds like Andre, you're using maybe one of the language drivers for an E4J to connect to your, your instance hosted in Heroku and, and that wasn't quite working. I, I think, you know, if you look in your application logs, hopefully the, the drivers there are giving you some indication of, of what the error is. Um, there, I don't think the drivers have a verbose setting for, for logging more output than they usually do. Um, you, you can also check the, the database query logs as well. But I think maybe a more general uh, answer to your question, I would say go on the Neo4j community forum uh, and post, post the question. And we have a lot of folks in the community and, and also Neo4j employees as well who watch those threads and, and give you a lot of back and forth to, to troubleshoot that and point you in the right direction. And that's community.neo4j.com. Um, is, is probably the, the place I would go to, to try to get some help to dive into that. Okay. And you, you've just said the magic word, community. Is there a strong community around Neo4j? Is there lots of help out there if people need it? Yeah, I, I, I think there is. I, I think there's a lot of folks who find Neo4j and, and, and graphs really exciting and, and kind of want to 
share a lot of uh, interesting things they found. So the, the community forum is a really good place for that. We have a lot of folks like sharing blog posts and projects that they're working on and, and mm. looking for help and, and collaborating on new projects. So that, that's an exciting place to go. We have a, a fun sort of dashboard when you go to that site that shows some of the most recent community projects that we found on GitHub, some of the most recent community blog posts, people talking about projects they're working on. Um, and that, that data actually comes from a, a GraphQL API that we built on top of what we call the community graph, which is a, a Neo4j instance that pulls in a lot of what people are working on that are related to Neo4j on, on GitHub, um, meetups uh, that we find in the community, things on, on Twitter, and we built a GraphQL API that exposes a lot of this data publicly, and then we just use that to pull it in on, on the community site. So that's a fun one. We also recently switched our community chat from Slack to Discord, um, which has been this is sort of a, a gradual process we've had. I, I think there's over 10,000 or so members on the uh, Near4j users Slack channel, and it can be kind of difficult to manage mm -hmm. and, and work with communities on Slack. And, and so we're hoping Discord is a better uh, better forum for that. But anyway, so that, that's another good point to, to sort of connect with the community on Discord as well. Um, so a friend of mine, um, chap called Chris Garden, um, he is the maintainer of the Neo 4J library for .NET. Um, he asked me to ask you if um, all of the Neo 4J community drivers, uh, creators, and maintainers are as awesome as himself. <laughs> yeah, I, I know Chris. Uh, yeah, he's he's kind of the the .NET uh, GraphQL or uh, .NET um, Neo 4J expert. Yeah, yeah, Chris is a great guy, and, and I mean, he as he points out, there are a lot of community maintained open source projects around near 4 j um, So for the, the client drivers, there, there's a handful of like official drivers that near 4 j maintains. And then there are a ton of community projects that make near 4 j more accessible in, in different languages and, and also like framework integrations built on top of those. So yeah, there, there's an awesome community of, of open source maintainers uh, for Neo4j. I will not uh, pick a favorite and just say that the, the community itself is, is great. Awesome. Well, when you next speak to Chris, tell him he owes me that tenor, all right? <laughs> will do. <laughs> and so we are need to wrap up now. We've only got a minute and a half left, but we've got some rapid fire questions for you, which we've been asking every speaker across the day, trying to get uh, the lay of the land of the developer ecosystem at the moment. And we're going to start with the most important one of all, tabs or spaces? Whatever prettier uh, is set to in my browser. That's, uh, that's the correct that answer. Works for me. <laughs> that is the correct answer. I mean, spaces is the proper correct answer, but that will do for, for, for this. Um, front end or back end? I think full stack, right? So I think full stack is, is really the future here that you, you kind of need to be able to, to work across both of those ecosystems. Okay. Um, serverless or frameworkless? Uh, let's go with serverless, although I've, I've got my eye on applicationless, which I think is the next evolution of serverless. So watch cannot, that space. I mean, you are mean for dropping that in 30 seconds before we get off the call. Thank you very much for that, William. <laughs> um, uh, what was the last one? Oh, yeah. Um, apples or bananas? Uh, well, I had a, a banana for breakfast this morning. I actually faced that very question. I, I had bananas and apples in the fruit bowl, and I went for the banana this morning. So there you go. Correct answer again. William, thank you very much for subjecting yourself to this detailed grilling um, after following your talk. And thank you again for being a part of the conference this year. It's been a pleasure to be your host. Um, have you got any parting words you'd like to give to the audience? I don't think so. Um, you know, big, uh, big shout out to everyone organizing the conference. Thanks for inviting me and, and thanks for putting this all together. Excellent. If you're watching along in Gathertown, make sure you visit those sponsor booths. There's still some goodies to be won. But for now, we're heading off to our next session. See you soon. <laughs>